Welcome everybody to another edition of the Anthony Peake Consciousness Hour. Um, today it's unusual in the sense that we'll be talking about me rather than about our guests. And uh, I'm delighted to say that um, a very long-term friend of mine called Martin Higgins, who's a journalist and writer, has agreed to interview me on my book, The Infinite Minefield. Uh, Martin recently interest, uh, interviewed me on his own uh, show, um, and that's proved to be extremely popular. And maybe Martin will tell us a little bit about his own show later on as well, because it's worth checking out. He's interviewed some very, very interesting people, including Dean Radin. But effectively, what we're going to be talking about today is the new book and exactly why I wrote it and some of the things that I discovered during my research. But very quickly, before we, we start off properly, um, I'd just like to um, discuss a little bit about um, what happened yesterday in that we, um, myself and Dr. Dirk Prokol and Dr. Uh, Engelbert Winkler and a couple of other guys were at the Mind, Body and Spirit Festival in Brighton. In fact, they're still here today, there today because it's a three-day event. Um, I was just there yesterday because I was doing a, a special presentation there uh, during the afternoon. But myself and uh, Martin Huckster, another long-term Atlantean member of my group, um, came down with me and we spent the day at the festival. But what was interesting was that um, the general response to the hypnagogic light, light device, which is the invention that I discuss in two of my books, including The Infinite Minefield, which has been invented by the two Austrian doctors, is, is a machine that actually facilitates the um, altered states of consciousness. And in, the, and in my new book, I suggest uh, various models by the way this may function, and we'll touch on those later, hopefully, if um, we get the opportunity. But what is interesting is that um, fairly recently, um, Dr. Winkler and Dr. Prokol uh, were in contact with uh, Stanislav Grof, uh, the American psychologist, I suppose, for want of a better term. Um, and Stan has this um, particular technique of... Um, holotropic breathing. And what my Austrian friends have discovered is that if you use the hypnagogic light device and at the same time you are trained to do this kind of very, very deep breathing um, that, that Stan has um, invented, uh, you can have very much more extreme experiences under the lucid light device that have previously been recorded. And uh, Dr. Prokop was explaining to me yesterday that when somebody is dying, what tends to happen is that they, do, they go through three different phases of breathing. And I wasn't aware of this, that apparently you breathe in one way, then you breathe in another, and you breathe in another. And as you're doing so, more and more carbon dioxide is actually effectively, I suppose, poisoning the brain in many, many ways. But what it does is it makes these, these sensations, these intense visions and images that you get using the lucid light device even more powerful. Now, of course, this clearly, again, draws parallels, as I've done many times with the, uh, the near-death experience, because the lucid light device seems to generate these, these sensations of going towards a tunnel and going through a tunnel. So that's just an interesting development, which uh, I will keep you briefed on as time goes on. Okay, without further ado, what I'd like to do now is to hand myself over to the tender mercies of Martin Higgins, who's up there on Wallasey on the Wirral, which is my hometown. And as I said to Dia we, um, before we went on air, but if Martin and I start to lapse into dialect, uh, please excuse us because uh, we're both from that specific area, which um, is known as God's Holy Acre, Twix, Mersey and Dee. Um, but um, let's hope that we don't get too broad in our uh, responses. OK, Martin, thanks very much for, for joining us. Thank you, Tony. Um, so this is your fifth book, The Infinite Minefield. Is that right? Uh, yeah, effectively, fifth? it's 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 my fifth. If you don't include the book uh, I co-edited and wrote a part of with um, Dr. Mahendra Pereira on the near-death experience, but effectively, I don't consider that to be directly my book. So yes, it is. And how does it um, fit into your work so far? And, and what's its, what's been its contribution to uh, to where your work is is going? Well, phenomenal, really. I mean, one of the things that, and you'll know as much as, probably more than most people, Martin, because you've been involved in, in my work for probably at least five years, is that all my books have been iterative in the sense that they, they develop a hypothesis um, stage by stage, although the, the curious thing is that I was never planning to develop 
an idea and the idea is the way I've done so. In fact, when I wrote Is the Life After Death, I expected that to be my one and only book because, you know, you genuinely believe that, that, you know, you've got one book inside you and that's about it because it's the one that's been playing around in your mind for many years. But what I found is that as I began to, to, to talk to people like yourself and broaden my horizons in terms of the individuals that I was actually talking to, the papers I was reading, and the, 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 the information I received um, through reading uh, and through talking to people was that the, 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 it started to move in a particular direction. Uh, and that direction it's been moving in really, I think, has culminated in the latest book, The Infinite Minefield, because I think this book genuinely pulls everything together. Whether it's the final volume, I don't think it is, but it's really progressed my ideas considerably further down the path away from the idea of being very, very based in the neurology of the brain, the, 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 the uh, neurochemical reactions in the brain, and suggesting that you know consciousness is effectively an epiphenomenon of brain behaviors and brain structures to a much more wider, non-dual worldview that effectively consciousness is far more than an epiphenomenon of the brain. And what happens when we die is effectively similar to what I put forward in the first book, but on a much broader horizon. You know, the idea that consciousness is more of a field, that kind of thing. Uh, so more in keeping so with this the is, this is sort of a Sorry, this is a, this is a panpsychic sort of perspective you've moved to. Yeah, to, to a certain extent, pan panpsychism is probably the perfect term for it, um, in the sense that I had never particularly realized in my early years that uh, the, my position had been somewhat restricted in this. And when I um, discovered, there was, a, there was a book I read about three or four years ago called Panpsychism in the West. The author escapes me now. But effectively, this book very much changed my opinion about how this belief system, again, is nothing new. The idea that there is a unity of consciousness and as, um, as has been very much said, you know, we're one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively, as Bill Hicks very, very cleverly said in one of his um, comedy monologues, is that this does seem to be the strong evidence that this is the case. Um, and there is strong scientific evidence that this may indeed be the case. For instance, on this show in recent months, we've interviewed uh, Professor Bernard Haish, and we've also uh, interviewed uh, Dr. Martin, Martin W. Ball, both of whom take the, the approach of what we call the entheological paradigm, which is the idea that through entheogens, this is uh, substances like dimethyltryptamine and similar substances, we can actually access the God within and indeed the God without, because the idea is that we are just one entity. Um, so and of course, that was the Yes, go Martin. Sorry. Yeah, so this, so this is what you're putting forward in the book, um, that, that it's the pineal gland that acts as a kind of uh, our link between our, our individual organisms and uh, the universal mind. Um, was that a hypothesis that you started with? Did you, did you have a hypothesis when you started the book? No, not at all. I mean, that's one of the, the, the way I write is always I go with the flow in that I will follow my nose or I'll follow my daemon, which is probably more of an accurate description if you actually use my own worldview in the sense that my, my own daemon, my own higher self or whatever seems to, to guide me along certain lines and I just follow it. And again, it happened again with this, this, with this book. You know, it was effectively I'd come across one academic paper which would lead to another academic paper which would then lead to another article and slowly the picture sort of came into focus. But I, I had no initial plans to, to go down the route. I was intrigued about the pineal gland and I did touch upon the pineal gland at the end of my book, The Out of Body Experience because of the experiences I personally had with the lucid, with the hypnagogic, hypnagogic light device, the lucid light device, because I believed that, and I still do, that that device in some way opened up my, my, my pineal gland. It sort of, sort of seemed to activate it in some way. So in which case, it's a personal thing. But I'll give an example of just how ideas seem to come to me and flow towards me in a, in a very, as we would say, us at Ladium's calling it, synchrondipitous, you know, that effectively there just seems to be the coincidences that come together, is that um, a few weeks ago, um, quite by chance, I came across a paper 
written by a guy called uh, Professor John Joe McFadden, uh, who is a research molecular biologist, biologist at the University of Surrey. And uh, John Joe McFadden has come up with the most amazing hypothesis about how the brain works that I've come across since the, the uh, Hammerhoff and Penrose idea of Orco R. And in fact, I think it's a more powerful um, explanator of how the brain functions. And John Joe suggests that each, we know that each neuron of the brain has uh, an action potential which is effectively like a small electrical impulse or electrochemical impulse that goes from one end of the neuron to the other, which is activated by, um, um, manipulated by uh, calcium ions. And by uh, calcium ions, a negative and positive charges makes the charge run down. Now, what he's, what he's noted is, and this is a known scientific fact, that this, this action generates a very, very small electromagnetic field around the neuron. Now, if you multiply this by the 10 billion neurons that are in your brain, suddenly you have a, a, a very, very effective um, electromagnetic field. And John Joe suggests that consciousness is not located in the neurons at all. It is actually located within the electromagnetic field that is generated by the neurons. So suddenly we have this fascinating idea that, that the neurons are facilitators of consciousness, but not in the way the standard science suggests, because one of the great mysteries of science is how is consciousness generated by, by neurons? Well, it's generated because it's in a field that's outside of the neurons. Now, this explains one of the major mysteries of modern science, which is the binding problem. You know, how it is that when I see a red car drive down the road, I see a red car. Whereas what is happening inside the brain is that the, the, the part, the red, is being processed by my, um, uh, my visual, by the visual areas of the brain, which is at the back of the head, the visual cortex. Whereas the movement of the car is actually generated somewhere else in the brain. I think it's the prefrontal cortex, but I'm not entirely sure on that. I need to check that up. But effectively, they're quite a distance away from each other. But they instantaneously or something brings the two elements together to create a controlled image. And this is the same for everything we perceive. And this thing is called the binding problem. Now, if, the, if, if consciousness is an electromagnetic field, it works on field principles, which means that a field communicates, every part of a field instantaneously communicates with every other part. So this is, this is a fascinating development. And I'm hoping to meet John Joe this Wednesday because I'm doing a big event in London, I'm doing a debate uh, in London, in central London, and I'm hoping that John Joe is going to be able to attend. So this just shows how the ideas develop. Now, this is not in the book. This is something that would have been in the book had I known about it, but it's already ideas for taking the book a bit further on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what is the role of the, of the pineal gland? And, and um, I read that there are crystals around the pineal and that they can tune into electromagnetic radiation? Correct. How, yeah, how does that again, work? Well, again, this is, again, with the, the work of, of John Joe, this becomes even more interesting. You know, the, 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 in, within the pineal gland, um, the, there, are, there are deposits which are called um, pineal sand, and they're very, very small crystals. And these crystals, like typical crystals, are piezo, piezoelectric. So they, they actually can become very, very sensitive to uh, changes in electromagnetic fields. Now, we, we, when I was a kid, you know, you used to make crystal sets, you know, which was a kind of very, very primitive radio that you'd use a crystal, and the crystal would actually pick up the electromagnetic energy in the, ra in the, in the, 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 yeah, the atmosphere around. Mm -hmm. Now, again, what is intriguing here is that the, the reason that they've started moving along these lines is because of the way, and I mentioned this in the book, is the mystery of how pigeons can, can find themselves, find themselves, um, you know, can, can home. You know, you can put a pigeon anywhere, but it will find its way back to where its home is. Now, around about three years ago, there was, I think it was um, probably solar energy storms or something that took place. And what happened was there were a whole, there, were, there was pigeon racing going on in the north of England at that time. And most of the pigeons got totally lost. And the reason they got lost was that the electromagnetic energy that was actually hitting the atmosphere was actually confusing the, the tiny piece of magnetite 
again, which is piezoelectric, which is in the, 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 the front of the, the nose of the pigeons. Uh, and it was confusing them. So this goes to show that even the pigeons themselves use electromagnetic radiation to, 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 to get themselves around the world. Now, mm. if the pineal gland and the pineal gland is piezoelectric, it means it's sensitive to electromagnetic fields, which could explain why it is that ghosts are seen in certain circumstances. Now, we had earth lights. You know, I know somebody called Paul Devereaux has been doing a lot of work on the idea of, 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 of UFOs being seen in places where the, the tectonic plates are very, very close together. And indeed, as a nice tie-in, my latest book, Philip K. Dick, on Philip K. Dick, a man who, who uh, remembered the future, um, I suggest that some of the reasons why Philip K. Dick had his theophany and his very, very curious experiences is that he was living very, very close to a fault line. And ironically enough, or interesting enough, it was only yesterday that I met somebody who had visited um, uh, Marin County, where Phil lived with his third wife, Anne. Second wife, third wife, third wife, Anne. And Marin County apparently is right, right on the San Andreas Fault. So effectively, Phil's, Philip K. Dick's visions that he had, even in the early 60s, were related in some way to electromagnetic energy. So here we have the idea that the pineal gland can influence the way we perceive external reality. But what, what's, what's, what's the connection to um, the fault lines and, and the Earth's energy then? How does, how does that... Well, well, what happens is there's certain forms of energy that are given off near fault lines, uh, and it's a similar kind of energy to the energy that um, uh, Michael Persinger has been working with uh, at the Laurentian University in Sudbury in Canada. And as you know, um, as, well, as you may know, I know you will know, but the audience may not know this, that um, uh, this guy has been working with uh, a converted, I think it's either a cycling helmet or an American football helmet, with electrodes inside it. And what he does is he uses the electrodes to stimulate the, the cerebral cortex. And in doing so, he can actually engender sensed presences, feelings that there's an entity close by, feelings of seeing things. Now, this shows how electromagnetic energy, which can be generated literally by the movement of the Earth, the actual friction between the fault lines, which generates the energy, and how this energy can be reproduced by Michael Persinger in such a way that it can influence the brain and how we perceive things. Now, it has been argued for some time that when ghostly presences are sensed or felt, it's normally when the place has got running water underneath, because running water again generates its own kind of electromagnetic field, which certain sensitive people under certain circumstances can pick up. Now, if this is the case, this explains how we can attune to alternate realities or things that are not part of our normal senses. Now, on top of this, the pineal gland is also light sensitive. So in which case, it literally is an eye. You know, it, it, it is an eye. And there's something here that is very, very intriguing in this, because one of the things I mentioned in the book is that at the 45th day of gestation, the, the, the pineal gland and the pituitary gland, the, uh, when, when a baby is developing, the pineal gland and the pituitary gland are effectively one single unit, and it is placed at the back of the throat. And after the 49th day of gestation, the pineal gland and the, the pituitary gland move up into the center of the brain, and then they become two separate glands. In doing so, um, there is an argument to say, which has been suggested by various researchers, including uh, an associate of mine, Beach Barrett, who lives in, in Asheville in North Carolina, who has suggested that this leaves a very, very tiny duct at the back of the throat, and which means that when the pineal gland is stimulated in certain ways, like by the lucid light device or when you go into deep states of trance or deep trance states of meditation, it generates something that's known as amrit or nectar. And what this is, is a kind of a metallic taste that people get at the back of the throat when they're in these yeah. altered states yeah. of consciousness. So the, now, the pineal I mean, creates that. The pineal creates it. What happens is the pineal is stimulated to endogenously, creates endogenously dimethyltryptamine. And the, some of the dimethyltryptamine, the, the effective internal ayahuasca, 
Now, again, as an aside here, and I'm bouncing all over the place, and my apologies for this, the, the pineal gland also generates uh, a substance called pinoline. And pinoline is, is one of the, the we known excretions. We know it excretes pinoline, and we know it excretes melatonin. But pinoline is an interesting substance because it's an MAO inhibitor. In other words, it's something that stops the actions of monooxidase amine, mono, monoamine oxidase, which is a substance that actually stops the hallucinatory properties of dimethyltryptamine being effective. And we know that ayahuasca, the drug that is, is, is taken, the brew that's taken down in Latin America, which is a concoction of two plants, chacruna and uh, banisteriopsis capi. Banisteriopsis capi actually contains, also contains uh, harmaline, which is also an MAO inhibitor. And what this does is, it means that when you drink ayahuasca, if you, if you, for instance, if you just ate the leaves of chacruna and just ate them, the DMT containing leaves, and they went into your stomach, nothing would happen. And they wouldn't happen because when they get into the stomach, the MAO inhibitor, the MAO comes out and it stops. This enzyme stops it coming across into the, from the stomach into the bloodstream. The, uh, the banisterius, the banisteria as, as capi contains harmaline, which actually then negates the ability of MAO to stop the DMT crossing into the blood. The pineal gland does exactly the same. It excretes dimethyltryptamine, which is the internal equivalent of the chacruna. It then excretes pinoline, which is the internal equivalent of the banisteriopsis capi. And in doing so, we create our own eternal, internal ayahuasca. Now, this ayahuasca brew then can drip down the back of the throat and be tasted during certain types of senses of ecstasy and when you're in altered states of consciousness. Now, this taste in the back of the throat has been known for generations. And I did a little bit of research on this for the book. And I found out that the dripping at the back of the throat, the, the Sanskrit word for this is something called shaktipat. And shaktipat is a mixture of two Sanskrit words. One is shakti, which means psychic energy, and pata, which means to fall. So here we have the kind of the, the, um, the, the, the linguistic background to, to exactly what this means. So it's falling psychic energy that falls down the back of the throat. Now, it's also known by the, the Greeks used to call this this concept nectar, the, 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 the taste of the gods, ambrosia. The word nectar also comes from Indo-European and comes from Sanskrit. And get this, nectar, neck in the word nectar means death, and tar means to overcome. So nectar, the word nectar, means to overcome death. Mm -hmm. You then move back to the word amrit, and amrita, which is also this taste. Amrita in Sanskrit means the Alexa of immortality. So suddenly you're getting this huge linguistic link that is explaining exactly what is taking place when we have this taste in the back of the throat. The taste itself is, is there's a technique that people use called Kekara Mudra. And Kekara Mudra is a technique that is taught whereby the adept of this particular technique learns how to roll their tongue back to the back of their throat in order to taste the nectar, the ambrit, the ambrosia, the, shak the shaktipat that's coming down the back of the throat. Now, Martin, I think you've experienced this, I think, this taste. Is, are you one of the people I know that's experienced this? No, but I, I know someone that has, and it was uh, on ayahuasca, actually, um, this strange dripping at the back of the throat, yeah. yeah. So, so, you can see, so you can see here, can't you, the power of the model I'm now developing, and I know it sounds egoistical, and I'm not meaning to sound egoistical, but this is really pulling together something quite profound. Now, one of the major issues that Rick Strassman has, Rick Strassman was the guy in the early 90s that got a grant from the American government whilst at the University of Mexico to do research into dimethyltryptamine, DMT, and how people react to it. And he wrote a book called DMT, The Spirit Molecule. And in this, he describes in detail 
the, the, the experiences that the individuals had. Now, one of the major, one of the major issues Rick had was that Rick argued that the pineal gland was in fact excreting dimethyltryptamine. The problem was that at that time there was no evidence that dimethyltryptamine was excreted anywhere within the brain. It had been found in blood, it's been found in spinal fluid, uh, it's been found in the liver, it's also been found in the uh, dead brains, but it's never been found active in a live brain, which of course is not surprising because it's, it, the MAO inhibitor stops it quite quickly. So the chances of you ever actually getting a live brain, testing it and finding live DMT in it is virtually impossible. Mm. However, a few years ago, they discovered things called the TARS receptors, T-A-A-R-S, which are trace amine associated receptors. The trace amine associated receptors are specifically designed to, to accept dimethyltryptamine. Now, just as an aside, a receptor site in a neuron is rather like a, a lock to a key. In other words, it's a specific shape. And depending upon the key or the neurotransmitter will depend on whether it will open or react or not. Now, this was the first evidence that it seemed that DMT could be an internal endogenous, endogenous neurotransmitter. Now, this has been suggested for some time. And uh, people like Arnold Ruho and there have been other researchers who have, have, have presented ar arguments that something called the sigma-1 receptor in the brain is precisely there to work with dimethyltryptamine. But the issue was there was still no evidence that dimethyltryptamine was in the brain. And if you go on the web now, you'll find that most people will turn around and say, that's where the hypoth hypothesis falls dead. Latest news, big news that really isn't as much out there as it should be, a lady called Jimo Borogin at the University of Michigan around about two months ago announced for the first time that dimethyltryptamine had been found in the live, that's being excreted by a mammal's brain, a rat's brain. They mm -hmm. found that dimethyltryptamine was being excreted by the pineal gland. Now, the reason they use rats is the neurological structures within a rat's brain is very, very similar to a human brain. So for the first time, we have absolute concrete evidence that dimethyltryptamine is produced by the pineal gland. We have the implications through the TARS receptors and the sigma-1 receptors that the pineal gland, in fact, uh, that, that DMT is a neurotransmitter. Now, if that is the so, case... So what... This is the, yeah. Finish the point. Finish the point. Yes. Yeah, so, th so this is the final key to say that DMT, as Rick has suggested, is actually the modulator of reality. It's DMT that facilitates our perception of reality externally. It's DMT that facilitates the near-death experience, the out-of-the-body experience, lucid dreaming, the whole thing. They're all DMT related. How does it um, facilitate the perception of normal reality? And um, it, I, I mean, I, I was about to ask you about uh, this non-local perception and, you know, connecting with the uh, universal mind. But how does, how does DMT firstly facilitate uh, perception of normal waking reality? Well, one of the, 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 the great mysteries of neurology is how the external world is modeled and created by the brain. In other words, I touched upon it earlier with the binding problem and the idea that we have a feeling of simultaneity with everything we perceive, whereas it's being processed by different parts of the brain. Now, the, the original um, explanation would, for this would have been the Cartesian idea, Rene Descartes' idea, that inside your head is this little man, the homunculus, and the homunculus sits in a little room like the numbskulls in the old English comic. And they sit in there, and they sit in a little room inside your head, and all the signals come into this one little room. And in this one little room, there's this little version of you that takes it all in. It's where it all comes together in the brain. Yeah. The problem with that is it causes an infinite regress. Because if there's a little homunculus in your brain, and it sees and it hears, it must have a little processor inside itself that must be doing the same. So it is self-evident that the Cartesian idea of the homunculus doesn't work. But we still have the problem of how it binds together. Now, mm. the suggestion, as John Joe uh, McFadden has said, is that because the brain works on electromagnetic principles, the brain itself 
has an ability to draw together information in a way that, that, that creates reality and our ex internal model of reality. However, in the book, what I suggest is that the, inter the e internal model of reality is as much fabricated by internal things as external. For instance, one of the great mysteries of life is what exactly is out there. Um, in the book, I cite the example of what I call um, uh, electromagnetic chauvinism. And it's the idea that we believe that what we see through our eyes is everything there is. But of course it isn't. What we see with our eyes is literally the visual part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Now remember, we're already saying that the brain works on electromagnetic principles. We know the pineal gland can be stimulated by electromagnetic principles. So here we have some very, very weird ideas about electromagnetism. But effectively, visible light is only a very, very small part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And I don't think many people realize just how small a part it is. For instance, if you took the electromagnetic spectrum from, I don't know, from radio waves through to gamma rays, which I think are the most energetic, but I'm not sure, uh, people will correct me on this, but they know the principle applies. It would be, and we made it the length of the Mississippi River from, uh, from uh, northern Minnesota, from the little lake in northern Minnesota down to the Gulf of Mexico. It's about 6,000 miles. Of course, if you actually turn in, if we don't use fractals and things, it's far longer than that, but basically 6,000 miles. The visual, the visual spectrum, the world that we think is everything there is that is fed to us through our eyes, would be one inch just south of Hannibal, Missouri. And that's it, one inch in 6,000 miles. Amazing. And we think, amazing. Yeah, and we think that's everything. It clearly isn't. So whatever, we th whatever the external world is, whatever the, the stimuli that we receive, it's brought in by electromagnetic radiation, or it's brought in by vibra vibrations which are sound, or it's brought in by the vibrations of you touching something else, and which of course, Again, we never touch anything in the external world. You feel you're touching something, you're not. What you're doing is your electromagnetic field, the energy of you is interfacing with the energy of the chair. That's why you don't fall through it, because 99% of it, 99.99% of it is empty space. And it's the energy that gives the feeling of solidity. So here we have again electromagnetic energy, and it's electromagnetic energy, which in effect is light, and it means that effectively this is everything. There is no inside or outside. It all just is. And it all just is this, this form of energy, which is somehow processed by the pineal gland, which exists within our brains, which seem to exist within three-dimensional space in some way. And that's where the magic so the, happens. So, so, the, pineal is so the, the pineal is central to all perception. The pineal seems to be the modulator of perception both internally and externally, um, in that it, it seems to be the thing that seems to modulate life. For instance, one of the great, one of the, the mysteries that, one of the, one of the major mysteries of neurology initially with the pineal gland was the one um, substance we know that the pineal gland, and has known for many years the pineal gland excretes, is something called melatonin. And melatonin is the, uh, the, the chemical that makes us want to go to sleep. Now, the ongoing mystery with that is the pineal gland is situated in the center of the head, the center of the brain. It's in a very, very dark place. There is no natural light in the center of the brain. So in which case, how does the pineal gland know it's going dark? How does the pineal gland know that it needs to excrete melatonin to make you want to go to sleep? The answer is that it sits slightly above something called, I think it's the suprachiasmatic, um, oh, and I can never forget, remember the second term for the suprachiasmatic, it's something like, it's the suprachiasmatic something, okay. And that sits above the, 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 the part of the brain which uh, the messages from the eyes, the electrical impulses that the eyes are sending to the, the, um, the, the back of the head, which processes the information back into a visual image. It sits above that. So there is actual photon leakage coming out into the, the subachiasmic area. And then it's the, 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 that then stimulates the pineal gland to realize 
that the, the, the energy or the information that's coming down has dropped off, which leads it to believe that it's gone dark, which leads it to believe it needs to excrete melatonin. So this means that it's the modulator of the sleep and waking cycles. It's also the modulator, strangely enough, of, um, of, of sexuality and, and growing, up, growing up. One of the major issues that they found with melatonin, the initial discoveries, was that uh, they came across young children who were being, becoming into puberty far earlier than the normal children. And they found the reason they were doing that, there was a problem with the pineal gland, and the pineal gland was excreting far too much melatonin, which was actually making the gonads develop and everything else. Also, its relationship with the pituitary gland is fascinating as well. They seem to be like the, the, um, the black and the white. They seem to work very closely together. And, of course, they should do because they started up as a single thing and they moved up into the, into the major areas of the brain. So it's almost like bootstraps theory here in the sense, is the pineal gland modulating reality internally and creating the illusion of external reality? In which case, it's part of the illusion, isn't it? Because... If there is no external space, and if there is no extension in space, and if there's no extension in time outside of the perceiver, how does the pineal gland work? Because it's part of that external reality. And that's the next area I really want to get my teeth into, you know, to understand how a model like this can work. And I have to say we're getting into some very, very deep areas of philosophy, the nature of being, ontology, you know, epistemology. It's really... Very, very interesting areas here, and this is where I'm planning to go with my next work. But, it, but it, there's a lot of in there. There's still a lot to do. So if we back up to the DMT, we, there's this receptor that they've discovered in the brain. So what happens when the DMT slots into this receptor in the brain? Well, that's when it, it works like uh, any other neurotransmitter, in the sense that it starts to transmit messages along the neurons. And by doing so, either facilitates the electromagnetic field, which it probably does, because what it will do is the, the neuro, what neurotransmitters do, they're the things that transmit information across the brain, across the synaptic gap, because no neurons touch each other. Each neuron in the brain, each 10 billion of your neurons is in contact with round about 10,000 other neurons through these um, synaptic synapses. Now, when the chemical goes across the synapse, a chemical can either be an inhibitor, which actually stops the message going along, or a facilitator, and it facilitates the message going across. In facilitating the message going across, dimethyltryptamine will rapidly move across the brain because brain signals move at about 800 feet a second, I think. It's somewhere of that region. So they can move across the brain very, very quickly, which can very, very quickly modulate what you're perceiving. So in which case it can stimulate the visual cortex to actually see things that are not in the external world and draw up information from somewhere else. Now, this is where the next bit of the hypothesis comes together, because I think what happens is the, there are photons generated by DNA. DNA generates photons. DNA, pho DNA generates electromagnetic fields. We also know that um, deep structures in the brain generate electromagnetic fields. We know that electromagnetic fields are also generated by something called the zero-point field, which is everywhere. So, so it's a form sorry, of say energy. that again. Can you, can you say that again about the zero-point field? The zero-point field itself is a form of energy that, it, that is found between subatomic particles. It's a form of energy that hypothetically, I mean, they know it's there. They have evidence for it. There's something called the Casimir effect, which actually shows that there is energy coming up from somewhere. For instance, if you, if you, you, you freeze something down to just above absolute zero and you freeze it down to that level, it still has energy coming up from somewhere, from deeper within itself. And it shouldn't because at absolute zero, there should be no energy by definition because that's what absolute zero is. The, 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 the electrons are not moving around anymore, so there's no heat being generated, so there's no energy. But they still find that at that level there's energy from somewhere. And this energy, according to people like uh, Irvin Laszlo, Bernard Heche, and various other researchers, is zero-point energy. And zero-point energy is the energy that is everywhere. It's the energy field of the universe. It's the energy field of reality. And everything we perceive is encoded 
within the zero point field. And of course, the zero point the, field, as Irving Lasler calls it, is the Akashic field. It's like the Akashic record of, of the, the Vedas. It's the idea that there is somewhere where everything is encoded. Now, I believe that under certain circumstances, the pineal gland can modulate electromagnetic energy and light that has been drawn up from the zero point field, in which case it can draw energy from the, the neurons around it. It can draw, and the neurons themselves probably facilitate this drawing up of energy from somewhere else. This is the light that people talk about when they talk about enlightenment. This is the light people see internally when they work with the lucid light device, the light they see when they have near-death experiences. Now, there is again strong evidence that the human body gives off light. We know that we have this um, piezoelectric effect, but we also know there are things called biophotons and something called bioluminescence which is the light that is given off by cells themselves. And in fact, Fritz Albert Popp, who was a researcher and probably still is at Liverpool University, was the guy that first worked on this. Now, on top of that, a guy called Istvan Bokken, who's a Facebook friend of mine, Dr. Dr. Bokken is a researcher in Hungary. Istvan has recently discovered that the eyes themselves give off biophotons, which means that the eyes themselves give off light into the external world, which means when people turn around and say somebody has dead eyes or their eyes are alive and there's light, this is actually really happening. We now know that light comes out from living creatures. So this means light is internally generated and externally generated. So we're getting some kind of feedback loop here. So we're getting the feedback so, so loop of the bio energy. Yes. So the, the light, the light is a medium between uh, our, our minds and this zero point field, which could be the the universal mind. Correct. Light is the medium. And this is where yeah. the universal mind comes in. So we've come back full circle now to the reason why things like dimethyltryptamine are called entheogens. The word entheogen means God within, because these facilitate an ability to go inside, deep inside within our own DNA structures to actually find the God within. And in the book, I suggest the God within is DNA. DNA itself is the God. If you if you read people like Jeremy Narby and the Cosmic Serpents, his book, Jeremy Narby comes very much to a similar conclusion that he believes that the snake symbolism that people have when they have ayahuasca journeys is the DMT communicating itself. For instance, if you look at the structure of DMT, it's like two snakes whirling around itself. Now, again, in the book, I refer back to the caduceus. I refer back to the way in which the Ida and Pingala, when people have Kundalini experiences, what are the Ida and Pingala? They're supposed to be two pillars or snakes going up the spine to enlighten this little thing at the top, the pineal gland. For instance, you look at the staff of Osiris, the design of the staff of Osiris. What you have is a central pillar and you have two snakes whirling around it. And at the top, there are two wings. And between the two wings, there's a single circle. The wings, the wings at the top are the hemispheres of the brain, symbolically. The circle at the top is the pineal gland. The structure down the middle is the, is the spine. And the snake symbols are the Ida and Pingala. Now, this goes back to Freemasonry. It's found in the Freemasonry symbolism. And very quickly, you then look at the symbolism of Freemasonry. What you get again and again and again is a picture of a pyramid. And the top of the pyramid is rising up. And in between is an eye, the all-seeing eye. <coughs> I only recently discovered, I should have known this because I do know a little bit of Greek, the word pyramid means pyramidus in Greek fire in the middle. It's symbolic of sacred geometry saying that the pineal gland is, is symbolized within this, this whole structure of the pyramid and the way in which the Masons. And again, if anybody's interested in this, I strongly suggest get hold of a copy of Manly P. Hall's fantastic book, The Secret of the Ages. Manly P. Hall was a historian of Freemasonry and the ancient mystic traditions he goes on and on and on about the pineal gland. 
and he goes on about it because this is the secret. The pineal gland is everything. This is the pineal gland is the most important structure in the brain, and the brain is the most powerful structure we know of in the universe. It's getting very intriguing stuff. So the Ida and the Pingala, which comes from the Vedic tradition, I think, which is the idea of these energy channels up the spine, Correct. is that to be taken literally that there are these energy channels, or is it, a, is it a symbol of the DNA itself? I think it's both. I think I, I have spoken to people who've had Kundalini awakenings, and the thing they say is that they fear feel this fire going up their spine and an explosion in their head. Now that form of energy, it's 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 the it's the it's the, the chi, isn't it? It's chi energy and whatever the, the 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 Sanskrit version of it. They're energy channels, and the energy channel the energy is generated internally. But of course, as well as that, there is coarse symbolism of what it all means, because of course we then, for instance, one of the things that um, I found out, and I'm still not sure if this is an apocryphal story, but effectively when um, Crick and Watson were trying to discover the structure of the molecule of DNA, they really had a problem because they couldn't understand how it was structured. And apparently uh, Francis Crick, was it Francis Crick? Was it Francis Crick? I never know which one was which. But whatever one, I think Crick, the English one, um, took LSD one evening, and while he was taking LSD, he saw the uh, images of snakes entwined in each other and rolling up and down. And when he saw the structure of the snakes in his LSD dream, and of course LSD can be argued to be an entheogen in exactly the same way, he came to, and then he realized, this is how DNA is structured. Now, I don't know, that's a story that's told many times, but whether it really happened, I'm not sure, but suffice to say, that's the story that's put around. So here we have again the idea that DNA itself wants to be discovered. And in fact, if Benny, Sh Benny Shannon tells the story, Benny Shannon is an Israeli expert on ayahuasca. Uh, and Benny Shannon spent time with the shamans in, in Latin America. And he tells the story, which might have been told by Alexander Shulgren, I'm not sure, that the shamans were asked how they found of all the plants in the Amazon of all 60,000, 50,000 different plants, how they've discovered the two plants, the Jacruna and the Banisteriopsis capi, that work together, that had the MAO inhibitor and the DMT, and how they did that. And the answer was amazing. They said when they were shamanic dreaming, they met the plants, and the plants told them where to look and how to make the substance. And by ayahuasca. Now, this again is a suggestion that DNA wishes to be discovered as being what it is. So the two elements, the, 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 the quick discovery of the structure of DNA and the way the shamans tell the story of how it was discovered. Mm. This is all the secret of the ages. This is all being drawn together. So there's an idea there that um, this or the mind has agency, that it's reaching into our minds. It's. It, I feel... And it's really amazing this because, you know, I'm a lifelong atheist and then agnostic, is that the evidence seems to be that it, it is now getting to the point where it is trying to communicate with us. Now, Martin, you and I know when we've discussed this very topic of the idea of the universe, in fact, we are all emanations of this, set, this consciousness. And what the consciousness is doing is it's living a life vicariously. In other words, if you were God, and you, you, you were just a single entity. You'd get bored. Of course you would. You, you've got nothing to do. So what you do is you create a universe, a computer program, a computer three-dimensional game, if you like. And the sprites on the screen, you can then choose to be each and every one of those sprites. And in doing so, you embody yourself in a, 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 a computer game. And in that computer game, you make sure you forget that you're God. So you don't know that you're God, and you live within the computer game. Now, Philip K. Dick, again, the genius that he was, in the exegesis, his, his tome that he wrote tons and tons about, he actually writes about this, and he put it in one of his novels. In the novel um, The Divine Invasion, there is a character called Manny, who's a little boy, Manny is God, but he's forgotten he's God. 
and he needs to remember that he's God. And the novel is his gradual discovery of the fact of who exactly he is. Now, Philip K. Dick himself said in his own theophany, which is again a discovery of God within, he argued that he had suffered anamnesis. And anamnesis is a, is a, a Socratic term that is the idea that we have forgotten who we are, and only through enlightenment do we discover the fact of who we really are, which is an embodiment of God within this world. Now, if you look to every religious tradition around the world, this is what they are saying, particularly the esoteric traditions such as Sufism, the Kabbalah, um, the, 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 um, the, the Gnostic Christians. It's all the idea that we are living in an illusion which we are trapped within. There's a plurama outside, which is the real reality, which is the single consciousness. But we're trapped within this. And again, comes back to Bill Hicks again, doesn't it? We are all yeah. one consciousness. It's leaning straight, it's making itself subjectively. This is a computer program. So, we are living within a computer program. So once we know that, where do we go? And and where, now that you've written about this, where do you go with your work? I know this, this is this is the thing. This is the thing that blows my mind. That there has to be a reason why this is all being pulled together now. Why is it? that me, well, I mean, this, this sounds vain, and I, I, I don't mean to be vain. I mean, you know me personally, you've met me many times, so you know I'm not like that. But why, if this is the case, how can a sprite, many sprites, because, I mean, other people are coming up with similar conclusions, but I'd like to believe I'm the only one that's looking at it in a, whole, a holistic way, doing the neurology and the philosophy and the historical perspectives as well, that if... We are now awakening to the fact of our own divinity. How can a sprite living in a computer program become aware of the fact that it's a sprite living in a computer program? Because surely that invalidates the whole computer program. And I sometimes wonder, and this, this is, this is, this is ridiculous, and I don't do mad theories about, you know, you know, sort of any kind of things like this. But if I was the person that was discovering this, there will be vested interests somewhere that will want to stop me. Because if I'm enlightening everybody by writing my books, I'm ruining the whole game. You know, if you're... Bill, if, Hicks, if you're, Bill Hicks said the same thing. Bill Hicks said the same thing, didn't he? He said, what, what do we do with the people... He said, exactly, he said, what do we do with the people that tell us this? You know, we shut them up because... These other people have so much invested in this in this game. So well, the idea, you know, if yeah, I, I know, and this is this. I know we were joking earlier on about the the archons, but I've been reading a lot of work recently uh, by is it John Lash? Um, I think it's John Lash, and he writes about the archons. Um, and if that is the case, they're not going to like it. Because there's arguments to say there are various levels of entities. Like when people have ayahuasca experiences, they, they, they come across <coughs> other entities. And these entities may have vested interests in keeping us down, trying to stop us crossing the barrier into the reality behind the reality. And is this why, and I go, this is crazy and stupid, but is this why so many things go wrong when I do my interviews and everything else? Now that's paranoia gone crazy. I don't believe that for one minute. But if I was given to that worldview, and if suddenly in the next month or two, you know, I fall under a bus or, 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 or I die for some reason or I just die under mysterious circumstances, you guys need to carry it on because that would be evidence of the fact that I had scratched the boil and the pus has come out and I've been ground in it. You know, I don't believe that will happen because I, 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 I don't believe that. But it is interesting no, it, to just postulate upon. It feels more upon. like... Martin, I just made an on joke, I didn't mean it. Scratching the boil. And I then said, this is something we can postulate upon. Or we can postulate upon it. Postulate because of course, it. to postulate is to burst a boil and have pus go all over you. That was my Damon. Same thing. Damon does these jokes all the time. Anyway. Yeah, I, I, sorry. I do feel that it's more like the, 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 the time is right and that, you know, for this stuff to come out. And, and you know, it makes me think about a... Uh, you know, 
a, a global culture or you know a huge culture that that accepts these things as reality you know that we are all connected we are all of the one and now we can live a more peaceful life potentially yeah. but because if if we realize that we will realize that the pain we give to others we're giving to ourselves and yeah. it will be suddenly be as Philip K Dick again was fascinated the concept of empathy you know if we knew what we really were we'd be empathic and is this is this you know the whole um change that people were ridiculously going on about uh, in 2012 is this the change that is really happening it's got nothing to do with the time change it's got nothing to do with the change from the age of aquarius or from the age of pisces into the age of aquarius or whatever it's nothing to do with that it's to do with inwardly the way we are thinking and seeing the universe and perceiving ourselves and if that's the case and i'm i'm a facilitator for that that's really great but i sometimes wonder is this why my work is not getting out as much as it should do mm. you know and i sometimes wonder well, I think, it seems strange i think it maybe the way it's going to come is that everybody who who wants it has to actually work for it whether it's experientially or or through their own rationality but but you have to do it as an individual you know it can't come through the mass media it can't come through some personality you know each of us has to has to go and experience it for ourselves perhaps so it will be a slow so. evolution it will be a slow evolution but when you actually make that decision for yourself as I, as i know and you know when you actually go and look online or or whatever it's amazing how many people have gone before you and are talking about these these things and the information is there it's so rich you just have to want it and go and look for it yeah because one of the things i just like to say is to thank uh, my friend Terry Allen for pointing out John Lash to me and i i took the opportunity to listen to some of John's if it is John Lash but it's definitely his surname Lash some of these interviews on Red Ice and it's intriguing i mean he really discusses the outcomes and everything else um i'm aware we're about to run out of time but i just like to touch very quickly and bounce it back to you because a lot of the things we're talking about here are, are themes in your own book Human Plus aren't they <laughs> Yeah, they are. Human Plus is uh, a novel that I wrote to um to promote non-ordinary states and and psychic experiences based partly on my own minor experiences. Um but I began that a few years ago and now at this at this point uh, I it really feels like the world has changed so much that you know I I don't need to I didn't need to in a sense promote these things because you know as we just said you know it, there's so much evidence out there or, already so um so that was the idea of the of the book was to was to promote these non-ordinary states which suggest um that reality is not what we were led to think it was um which which your work um is um communicating to so many people now Well, one of the things I, I've, I've, I was fortunate and delighted when you gave me an advance copy of uh, Human Plus to read, uh, and I know I had the original version and then the later version, and it genuinely is a fantastic book. I really enjoyed reading it because it works as a mystery story. You know, you you, you identify with the central character, and you share his confusions as he encounters mysterious organizations, and he becomes part of this mysterious organization. I won't ruin it any more than that. But Martin, could you tell the listeners and and the people that uh, will be watching this um this video as to how they can actually uh acquire copy copies of Human Plus? Yeah, um they can go to my website which is um martinhiggins.net um where there's some information about it. And then there's links to the uh, the Amazon sites where they can pick it up. Excellent. So, okay, well, thank Amazon. you. wonderful and i really do strongly advise to to check this book out i mean it really is and i i it looks like i'm just saying that but i really really did enjoy it it was really excellent okay thank you very much everybody for for listening in uh for the latest of the uh, edition of uh, anthony pig's consciousness hour um our next guest will be um um manjeer samantha lorton dr manjeer samantha lorton who is uh, a medical doctor who has really sort of pushed the envelope in terms of um the interface between reality and consciousness and in fact um many of you may have read her amazing book punk science um she also has something called the black hole principle um manjeer and my manjeer and um her associates have recently um 
uh, set up um, and interviewed a group of people, including myself uh, and many other thinkers, uh, in a new movie, which is actually also going to be called Punk Science. So um, next month I'll be interviewing Manjia about her career, her background, what shakes her tree, why she wrote Punk Science, and exactly what she means by the black hole principle. So please join us again uh, in a month's time uh, and ever onwards then on, uh, on YouTube uh, with another edition of the Anthony Peake Consciousness Hour. Thank you very much.